A Boeing 737 erupted into flames at Manchester Airport in England on the morning of August 22, 1985. The onboard fire killed 55 people, injuring over a dozen others. Fire and noxious smoke quickly filled the cabin which resulted in a mass panic on board. The results of the investigation provided great changes to fire and evacuation procedures and regulations in the aviation industry. But how did this fire occur? What were the contributing factors? And what changes have been made since? The destination of the accident flight in question was the Greek island of Corfu. The island has long attracted holidaymakers and tourists during the summer months. The British are among some of the most frequent visitors to the island. In August of 1985, British Air Tours Flight 28M, operated with a Boeing 737-200 aircraft, was to make a flight to Corfu departing from the city of Manchester. 131 passengers would board the plane, mainly tourists heading to Corfu to enjoy some time away from home in the sun. Just over two hours before the disaster occurred on the runway at Manchester, the flight crew reported to the airport for work at 5am on August 22nd. 39-year-old Captain Peter Terrington was a seasoned pilot with over 8,000 flight hours. His past flying experience included flying the Hawker Siddeley Trident before the Boeing 737. Senior First Officer Brian Love, age 52, had accumulated over 12,000 flight hours by the time of the incident. He too also had extensive experience flying other aircraft before the 737. Both pilots are fairly new to the plane, with a combined flying time in the Boeing 737 logging in at just over 1500 hours. Captain Terrington performed a walk around that morning to visually inspect the outside of the plane. He would have checked everything from the landing gear to the condition of the wings and visual inspection of the engines. The walk around practice serves as a preliminary check before flying to make sure the plane is of a satisfactory standard and in accordance with regulations. The walk around usually only consists of inspecting the outside of the plane. While the captain was out on the walk around, First Officer Brian Love was performing pre flight checks on the flight deck. As normal, other pre flight requirements were also performed before the passengers began boarding. Aircraft documents were reviewed, and the cabin crew were also briefed. The airline, British Air Tours, was a subsidiary of British Airways. The airline was BA's offshoot to focus on charter and leisure flight services, often to Mediterranean destinations. The Boeing 737-200 was the most abundant plane in the airline's fleet, of which other aircraft in the airline at the time in 1985 included the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar for longer range services. At just after 6 in the morning, the engines on Flight 28M were started up. First Officer Love would be the one at the flight controls on this flight. On the previous day, he had actually flown this plane and had made a note in the technical logs in relation to a slow startup on the left side number one engine. This was discussed with the captain and the engine started up and performed as normal this time. At 6.08, clearance was given from the control tower for flight 28M to taxi out to runway 24, which was the only runway at Manchester in 1985. Upon reaching the end of runway 24, British Air Tours Flight 28M entered the runway and was given takeoff clearance at 6.12. With the first officer handling the flight controls and the captain monitoring aircraft systems, the Boeing 737 begins to power down the runway. As the plane was powered, the first officer commented on how the performance of the number one engine was better than it was the day before. The routine 80 knot callout was made by the captain to which the first officer cross-checked on his speed indicator. 12 seconds later, just before the plane reached V1 speed, what was described by the accident report as a loud thud was heard throughout the aircraft by not only the pilots but also the passengers and cabin crew. One surviving passenger later commenting on how they instinctively knew this was a serious issue. To understand where this loud thud came from, we need to more closely look at the number one engine on this plane Located in side jet engines are components called combustion chambers or combustion canisters. The purpose of these engine components is self-explanatory. It is here where the fuel is ignited. There are several of these combustor cans on each of the Boeing 737's engines. Canister number 9 is of particular interest on this flight. A crack had developed around the circumference of the can due to thermal fatigue. During the event, 
this can had bent and contorted its connections to other parts of the engine. Eventually, combustion can number 9 failed with explosive results. The dome of the combustion can was ejected from the engine with just the right trajectory that it penetrated the fuel access panel underneath the left wing. This underside section of the wing was not designed with any kind of impact scenario in mind. It was not required for it to be reinforced for such an incident. Fuel immediately began pouring from the puncture in the fuel tank. According to the British Air Accident Investigation Branch's report on the matter, there was no clear time frame for when the subsequent fire exactly started, although it is believed and backed up with accounts from surviving passengers that jet fuel was being ignited outside of the plane from coming into contact with hot material and combustion flames coming from the damaged engine. When the initial thud was heard by the flight crew, their first speculation was a burst tire. By the time the noise was heard, the plane was still below the V1 speed, V1 being what pilots often refer to as a point of no return or a commitment to departure, as by then, it would no longer be safe to abort the takeoff. Being below this speed, the pilots promptly called for the takeoff to be aborted and began to brake, Captain Terrington emphasizing to his first officer to not harshly apply braking pressure. The flight crew, unaware of the substantial damage to both the left engine and wing at this point, deploy the reverse thrusters. On the Boeing 737-200, the reverse thrust works with the help of two large buckets which deploy themselves at the rear of the engine to redirect airflow forward. It was not until the plane had slowed from its maximum indicated speed of over 120 knots down to around 85 knots when the fire alarm in engine 1 was activated. This information was relayed to air traffic control and the reverse thrusters were deactivated. With the plane slowing down, the focus was now redirected to getting the plane off of the runway. Even though First Officer Love was handling the flight controls, the nose steering tiller is on the captain's side of the cockpit, so at some point, control of the aircraft needed to be handed back to the captain. This was already on top of the captain's high management workload during this time. As the Boeing 737 slowed, the captain turned the plane off towards an offshooting taxiway. The captain then called for evacuation over the PA on the right side of the plane. Immediately following the plane coming to a halt on the taxiway, the fire drill for the number one engine was performed. It was noted in the checklist for both engines to be shut down as soon as possible, to prevent injury to escaping passengers and damage to the emergency slides, and to not delay if any possibility of smoke or fire exists. As the plane turned, the relationship between the plane and the wind direction changed relative to the plane's angle. The position of the aircraft once it stopped meant that the wind was now blowing against the plane where flames engulfed the rear fuselage. The wind at the time was only slight, measuring around 5 to 7 knots. Not strong enough to significantly change how a pilot might control the aircraft, but slight enough to influence the fire and smoke pouring out from the left engine. In the cabin, Fire began penetrating the skin of the plane at between row 17 and 19. Most people seated in this section of the plane would not make it out of the aircraft. Insulation proved to be inadequate at shielding the inside of the cabin from the inferno outside. Fire and smoke had also gained access to the air conditioning running underneath the cabin flooring. The investigation determined that the fire penetrated the cabin no later than 22 seconds after the plane turned off of the runway. Also going on further to say, that this could have been as low as just 5 seconds after the plane came to a halt. Fire and toxic smoke was pouring into the cabin. There were only two members of the cabin crew located at the front of the plane who had extensive experience on the 737, one being the purser. The other two cabin crew members stationed at the rear of the aircraft were much less experienced. These two crew members, along with many passengers at the aft end of the cabin, sadly perished in the disaster. Upon hearing the captain's orders, the two forward cabin crew without delay promptly responded by attempting to open the front right door as per the captain's instructions. However, the door was jammed and at first would not open. The purser then took drastic action and opened the front left door where the emergency slide was activated. Whilst the purser was performing the operation of the doors, their colleague also stationed at the front needed to keep passengers away from the galley at this time. Passengers began pouring into the aisle, creating a large queue. Very little is known of the actions of the other two cabin crew members at the rear of the cabin. What is notable is that the R2 door was opened just before the plane stopped on the taxiway, 
and multiple eyewitnesses claimed to see one member of the cabin crew standing in the doorway. This doorway was quickly overcome by smoke, and likely due to the rapidly deteriorating conditions at the back of the plane, the door was open before the plane stopped. No one exited the plane through either of the two rear doors. Some passengers did make it through the right side overwing exit. However, at the time, there was no requirement that passengers seated in the emergency exit rows be briefed on how the doors should be operated in an emergency. As such, the doors were not opened immediately following the evacuation order. It was not until after there was a buildup of passengers in the aisle and the imminent threat of death that a passenger would try to open the overwing doors themselves. The passenger seated in seat 10F, a woman, was seated as she tried to open the door without any instruction on how to do so. The passenger who sat next to her came to her assistance as they were better positioned to see the release handle and instructions on the door itself. As the passengers were not briefed on how to open this door, they pulled the door inside the cabin where it was later found in row 11. Passengers in modern times are now told to throw the door outward away from the cabin. Only the right side wing exit was open for obvious reasons. Incidentally, the passengers seated in seats 10C and 10D aisle seats were carrying infants and were able to escape through the opened overwing exit. 27 of the 131 passengers on board exited via the wing. 17 occupants would leave through the front left and a further 35 through the front right once the door was eventually opened. The two members of the flight crew escaped through the right side cockpit window and survived. The two flight attendants at the front of the cabin remained on board until they were at a critical risk of being overcome by smoke themselves and urged to leave the plane by firefighters. They were later commended for their courage and bravery. Only five passengers seated from row 16 to the rear of the cabin survived. The majority of the survivors were seated towards the front. In total, there were 82 survivors, whereas 55 people on board died in the Manchester runway disaster. One of the deceased escaped from the plane but later succumbed to their injuries. The investigation led by the Air Accidents Investigation Branch in the UK determined that the delay of 25 seconds in opening one of the forward doors had severely affected the survivability of passengers on board. It was concluded that the main cause of the fatalities was incapacitation due to the inhalation of toxic smoke and the delays in evacuating the aircraft, of which should have only taken 90 seconds maximum. The investigation would consider the possibility that the fractured combustion can may have come from a previous engine repair which was carried out in 1983. It was considered that this repair did not include any heat treatment which was required. The investigation ruled that this would not have had any significant effect on the fatigue it was supposed to induce. The fatigue cracks did coincide with welding work that was done during that repair, but investigators could not conclude whether the quality of this repair contributed to its failure. Sweeping changes in the aviation industry were made following the British Air Tours accident. Procedures would now come into force where pilots must now position their aircraft downwind of a fire to mitigate any fire that could burn into the cabin. Aircraft interiors, including walls, ceilings and seats, would now need to be fire resistant. Cabin crew training and passenger briefing was also re-evaluated. Cabin layouts themselves would change so there can be no bottleneck of passengers around the bulkheads of the cabins. The disaster of British Air Tours Flight 28M became one of the UK's worst aviation disasters. Multiple memorials were made in remembrance of the disaster, the latest of which was completed in 2018. Hello, good evening everyone. Thanks once again for making it to the end of another video. If you found this video interesting, be sure to subscribe as there are new videos every Saturday. Just a quick thing, just to let you know that the week beginning the 7th of June, I will be away taking the week off. However, I will be working so that there will still be a video that week ahead of time. It is time once again to thank my patrons for their continued support. If you would like to get your name featured or read out at the end of the next video, you can join my Patreon from £3 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment as always. So a thank you to my £5 patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Hector Palmatellas, a new joiner to the Patreon, Ian Tatum, Jacopo, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Marie Innes, Pac-Man 7, and Panic Chicken. And finally, for the five pound tiers, is uh, a newcomer, So FP. A very special thanks to my generous 10 pound patrons, 
And we do have a couple of new names here as well. So thank you to Cade, Cherub Cherub, Daniel Hendricks, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Robert Hamilton, Roger Mayer, and Will Tanner. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for watching, and that is it from me this week. Have a great weekend, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye.